Welcome to lecture 25 of our course on high performance computing. We are currently looking at the different kinds of hazards that a programmer should be aware about in connection with uh, pipeline processors. And in talking about the control hazards, hazards which arise due to control transfer instructions, we were looking at the role that the compiler may have to play. And this, uh, the compiler's role arises through the, I mean, the existence of what are called delayed branches in instruction set architectures. A delayed branch is a branch in which the effect, the control transfer of the branch happens only after some of the following instructions in the program. So the compiler may have to actually identify instructions which could be used to fill the resultant branch delay slots. In the example which we used, where there's one branch delay slot, notice that there is a branch of equal to zero instruction, the branch delay slot following it, and the fall through path. This particular example, we are seeing how the first instruction from the branch target could be moved into the branch delay slot. In this particular example, the add i instruction is at the target. Therefore, if I move the add i instruction into the branch delay slot, the target will now be, the target address will now be that of the load word instruction. And in order to correct the code in terms of what happens if the branch is not taken, there has to be patch up code which will suitably undo the work that was done by the branch delay slot instruction which had been moved from the target address. So in general, compilers may have to generate code along lines like this in order to find good instructions to move into the branch delay slots. Now, um, the possibility that I had outlined after that was that there could be pipelines in which there is more than one branch delay slot. You may be told that the two instructions following a conditional branch instruction will be executed whether or not the branch is taken. And therefore, it may end up being a situation that in practice, the compiler may not always be able to find useful instructions to put into the branch delay slot. We do have to bear in mind that whenever the compiler moves some instruction into the branch delay slot, there may be the need to put patch up code, corrective code. And if one takes the corrective code into account, the, 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 the penalties of using uh, this kind of uh, idea may get more and more. Therefore, th this question too does have to be addressed. What if the compiler cannot find useful instructions to put into the branch delay slot. The compiler may consider an instruction from the target address, could, could then consider an instruction from the fall through address, could then cons consider instructions before the branch instruction and may end up not being able to find a useful instruction that can be moved without guarantee of low overhead in terms of the resultant patch up code. So the question is what could the compiler do in such a situation if no useful instruction can be found. Now if this is the case, the compiler does not have the luxury of stalling the pipeline for one cycle, that's, that is a hardware activity, but the compiler must do the next best thing and that might be to insert an instruction that does nothing. If the in compiler inserts an instruction that does nothing into the branch delay slot, then the net effect is going to be something like that of a stall cycle, but it will have no incorrect action as far as the program is concerned. Okay, so the instruction will do nothing other than occupying the branch delay slot. Of course, being an instruction, the instruction will have to be fetched and decoded, but other than this, the instruction will do nothing. Then let me give you a simple example of such an instruction. Consider the MIPS1 instruction add R0, R0, R0. This instruction has as its two source operands R0. It adds R0 to R0 and puts the result in R0. You'll remember from our first lecture where we talked about the MIPS1 instruction set that R0 is a special register. It has a property that it always contains the value 0 and cannot be modified, cannot be modified to contain any other value. Therefore, in effect, the add R0, R0, R0 instruction reads zeros from the register file and does not modify the register file in any way and in effect has no impact on the register file. And in fact, other than being an instruction, has no impact on the rest of the processor state at all. Of course, it is an instruction, it therefore does cause one more, the program to be one instruction larger than it would have been otherwise, but has no other impact on the program and could therefore be viewed as an instruction that does nothing. Now, in our discussion of the MIPS1 instruction set architecture, the, we did not find an instruction included explicitly for the purpose of doing nothing. And that is why we had to invent an instruction which did practically nothing. And by the way, you could think of many other examples in the MIPS1 instruction set of 
in, instructions which have a, similar characteristics to the add R0, R0, R0 instruction. But uh, the thing to note is that if this requirement of the compiler was known to the person designing the instruction set architecture, then they could actually have included an instruction in the instruction set which did nothing. And if they had to make up a name for that instruction, they may call it a no operation instruction or it might be known as NOOP or NOP for short. And there are some instruction sets which provide a NOOP instruction for use in cases such as the one that we encounter here. In other, in other instruction sets where it is very easy to generate an instruction that does practically nothing, it was not felt necessary to have explicit hardware NOOP instruction. However, since we suspect that the compilers may frequently be using NOOP instructions of this kind, and I will refer to this as practically being a no-op. It may be the case that assemblers like the MIPS1 assembler may provide a notation by which rather than typing add 0, r0, r0, one could just type no-op. And that no-op might be included in the assembly language if not in the machine language. Because there could well be other situations in addition to the one that we are in right now where it is desirous to have an instruction that does nothing. Okay, now with this uh, brief comment about the compiler's role in branch prediction, um, okay, I, I, I should also point out that the NOOP does practically nothing and in that sense it really has the same effect as a stall cycle in that the stall cycle caused there to be one cycle in which no instruction completed. The NOOP in some sense is not a useful instruction of the program and therefore the cycle in which it completes should not be counted as a cycle in which a useful instruction of the program completes. And in that sense one could view the NOOP as having the same effect as a stall cycle but it is a software generated event whereas a stall cycle would have been something generated by an interlock, a piece of hardware which, we, which may not be available in the processes that we are talking about. Okay, now with this uh, general discussion about uh, pipelines and the discussion about hazards which are things that the programmer or compiler should be aware about, the question then arises of uh, how, can a, how can this knowledge change the way the programs are written? How can pipelines, our knowledge of pipelines affect our perspective on programming? So I thought at least one example of knowledge of pipelines helping in changing the way one programs may be beneficial. So first of all I need to tell you the framework in which we will be talking about uh, the processor and the instruction set. And now that uh, we have a uh, instruction set that we are comfortable with, in other words the MIPS1 instruction set. I will use the MIPS1 instruction set as the instruction set for the example. We have additional complications in that now that we know so much about pipelining, I also have to specify properties of the pipeline because they are going to be relevant to us as programmers in analyzing the code that we are going to look at. And therefore I am going to additionally tell you that being, this is a MIPS1 processor, the one for which we are going to uh, analyze the, the, the code fragments that follow. It is a MIPS1 processor in which there is one load delay slot and there is one branch delay slot. And you will remember that what it means to be a load delay slot is that whenever there is a load instruction, the instruction following the load cannot safely use the register which is being loaded and therefore should not use the register which is being loaded as a source register. And the one branch delay slot from which by which you will understand that if there is a conditional transfer instruction or a branch instruction then the conditional tr tr transfer occurs not after the branch instruction but after the instruction following the branch instruction. In other words, the instruction in the branch delay slot is executed whether or not the branch is taken. So we now understand what these two terms mean. In addition to these two complications from the, pers from the perspective of the pipeline, I am going to add one more. You, you realize that when we were talking about the instruction set architecture, the MIPS1 instruction set architecture, I showed you extracts of co the contents of the instruction set architecture manual which indicated that there was a load delay slot and there was a branch delay slot. From this you should you realize that there could be other pages in the instruction set architecture manual which contain other warnings about complications which are raised which might be of interest to the programmer but which arise from properties of the pipeline. So I am going to artificially just add one more and this relates to floating point arithmetic instructions. The warning is as written, the two instructions that follow a floating point arithmetic operation cannot use the value computed 
by that instruction. In other words, if there is a floating point add instruction, then the two instru and the floating point add instruction writes a result into let us say register F0. You will remember that when we talked about the MIPS floating point instructions, I was using a separate set of registers for the floating point values and they, they were not called R0 through R31, they were called F0 through F31. So this particular warning is tell this particular warning indicates that if there is a floating point arithmetic instruction such as the F add, floating point add, which adds the contents of F2 to the contents of F4 and puts the result into the register F0, then the two instructions that follow it cannot use the value computed by that instruction. In other words, the two instructions that follow should not use F0, which is the value computed by the floating point add instruction. So I have just artificially added this third complication to make the analysis a little bit more interesting. So we are talking about a pipeline implementation of the MIPS1 instruction set architecture which has both integer and floating point capabilities which has one load delay slot, one branch delay slot and two slots after any floating point arithmetic operation in which the value computed by the floating point arithmetic operation cannot be used. Okay. Now we need to think of a specific program to analyze. So I will use a specific program that I had talked about earlier in passing and it is going to be just a very small piece of code to allow us to do, do this discussion in a short period of time. Now the, what, what this specific uh, program is, uh, code fragment is going to do is vector addition and uh, basically this uh, C code fragment tells us, tells you what I am talking about. So in this C code fragment I have two um, double precision floating point arrays declared, one of them is called A and one of them is called B, both of them are of size 1024 and these one dimensional arrays are what you could think of as vectors. What the code fragment is going to do is, is it is going to add an element of A to the corresponding element of B, in other words A of 0 added to B of 0 and this becoming the new value of A of 0 and this is done for all of the 1024 elements of the array. So as essentially what is happening is the vector A is being added to the vector B and the result is the new value of the vector A if one is using vector notation. That is what this code fragment is doing which is why I describe this as a vector addition program or a vector addition loop. Okay, now the, the first question that will arise is what will this C code fragment look like in the MIPS1 instruction set architecture. So we need to do that compilation first. Let me just remind you that we are dealing with two arrays, they are of double precision. What we mean by double precision is that unlike the single precision, the values could, if, if under IEEE single precision, each floating point value was represented in 32 bits, in IEEE double precision, each floating point value is represented in 64 bits, right? That is what we mean by double. And each of the vectors is of size 1024. So if we have to consider writing the vector addition loop in uh, the MIPS instruction set architecture, the MIPS instruction set, then what I will do is I will first write it in a pseudocode commented form and then we will get the MIPS instructions to do the same. So I will start by assuming that the address of A of 0, remember the loop starts by adding A of 0 the, the, uh, with I equal to 0, A of 0 is added to B of 0, the result goes to A of 0 then A of 1 added to B of 1, the result goes into B of 1 and so on. So I will start off by assuming that register R1 contains the address of A of 0 and register R2 contains the address of B of 0 and there could be preceding instructions which cause this to happen but let me assume that this is what, what we have to start with in the code fragment that we are going to deal with. Now in order to add A of 0 to B of 0, I first have to load the value of A of 0 into a floating point register. So I will assume that that is done. So I load the value of A of i in general or A of 0 in this particular case into F of 0. After this I must load the value of B of 0 into a floating point register. Subsequently I can add F of 0 to F of 2 and maybe put the result into F of 4. At this point in time I need to store this result back into A of 0 for which I need a store word instruction but uh, let me show it as in, in the pseudocode notation, whatever the value in f of 4 is written into a of, a of i, which is going to require a store instruction. After this, what has to be done? 
Now, I'm basically writing something which is going to be a loop. Before I can loop back to the beginning of the loop, obviously I will need to increment the value in R of 1. I'll also have to increment the value in R of 2. So that the second time that this sequence of instructions is executed, I don't once again fetch A of 0, but I fetch A of 1. So the question is, by how much do I have to increment R1 in order to make R1 contain the address of A of 1? And if you remember that we are dealing with double precision where the size of each vector element is 64 bits, in other words, 8 bytes, then since the MIPS1 instruction set architecture talks about byte addressability, I will actually need to increment R of 1 by 8 in order to make it point at the address of A of 1. So I increment R1 by 8. Similarly, I will have to increment R2 also by 8 because R2 at any given point in time should contain the address of the next element of the vector B. So I increment R2 again by 8. Subsequently, I need to check whether I have finished doing this operation 1024 times or not. And if I have not finished doing it 1024 times, I need to loop back to the first instruction in the sequence. So uh, there's going to be the loop creation. So the question is, how do I set up this check to see if I have finished incrementing, I have finished uh, the vectors, every single element of the vector. And the way that I'm going to set it up for this particular code segment is, I'm going to assume that I have another register, which I call R3, which contains an address which is just beyond the, uh, I'm sorry, it contains the address of a of 1023. In other words, it contains the address of the last element of the vector A. So just like I loaded R1 to initially contain address of A0 and I loaded R2 to initially contain the address of B0, I load R3 to contain the address of the last element of the array A, the vector A. Therefore, in order to see whether the termination condition has a, a reached or not, I just need to check whether the current value inside R1 is equal to the current value, is less than or equal to the current value inside R3. And if that is the case, I need to loop back. So I'm using this as a quick way to set up the, 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 the condition check for whether to loop back or not. From here, it will be quite easy for us to write the equivalent uh, MIPS1 instructions. I have to start by writing the instruction for loading into f of 0 from a of i, from, from a of i which is going to mean loading into f of 0 from the address, which is displacement of 0 from the address contained in R1. And that's going to be a simple load instruction. Now, uh, since we're talking about the floating point registers, rather than using um, the, the LW instruction, which was useful for the integer registers, I need to have a separate set of instructions and the notation which I am using is to refer to the floating point load instruction as f load. So I load into f of 0 out of 0 r1, similarly I load into f2 out of 0 r2 as we had seen. Then I do the addition using an f add instruction, f add r4, f0, f2. After this I need to store the contents of f of 4 into the memory location associated with a of i, which in this case is once again going to be spe specified by 0 R1. So I'll call the floating point store instruction F store. So we F store into 0 R1 from F of 4. Then I need to increment R1 by 8. I can use the integer increment instruction for this. So add I R1 R1 8 and increment R2 by 8, add I R2 R2 8. After this, I need to have a check to see whether R1 has gone past the end of R3 which I can do by checking if branch of less than or equal R1, R3 loop. So if the contents of R1, in other words, I have not gone beyond the last element of, of, uh, of, uh, of the vector A, I loop back to loop. So we have this sequence of seven instructions which corresponds to an iteration of the uh, vector addition loop. Now if I analyze this uh, sequence of seven instructions, and let me just go back and remind you what our base assumptions are. Our base assumptions are that this piece of code is going to execute on a pipeline where there is one branch delay slot, one load delay slot, and the specific requirement that two instructions following a floating point arithmetic operation cannot use the value computed by that instruction. So if I analyze the, this piece of code in that light, then I realize that 
consider the first load instruction, there is one load delay slot. So, I have to make sure that the instruction following that this load does not use the value being loaded and I find out that that is perfectly ok because the fload f2 instruction does not use f0. I analyze the second fload instruction, it loads into f2 and unfortunately I notice that the instruction following the fload f2 instruction uses f2 which means that there is actually a need to separate these two instructions by one instruction potentially by adding a no op between them. So, I am going to indicate that there is an potentially a need to separate the fload instruction from the fad instruction by one no op by putting a, a I, I do not know what you call that, but you can view that as being something like a bubble, but in general I am using that notation in this slide to avoid having to write n o p or no op in, in fullness. So, I need to insert something between the f load and the f add to serve the purpose of the no op. So, that is one situation that uh, is hazardous. Are there any other situations that is hazardous? I have taken care of the two uh, load delay slots. I still have to worry about the branch delay slot and the requirement that the two instructions after a, a floating point arithmetic operation cannot use the value being loaded, uh, I am sorry, cannot use the value computed by the, uh, by the arithmetic instruction. So, immediately I handle the branch delay slot by noticing that there is a need to put a no op or some other instruction into the slot after the branch. Then I look at the only arithmetic instruction, floating point arithmetic instruction in my program and I note that it computes a value which goes into f4 and unfortunately f4 is used by the next instruction and therefore from the third warning about my pipeline I realize that there is a need to put two no ops between the f add and the f store. Therefore, in analyzing this particular implementation of the vector addition loop, I note that there are seven instructions which are useful and in addition to that potentially four instructions no ops which would have to be inserted in order to cause this vector addition loop to run correctly on the pipeline that we are talking about. Therefore, I would talk about this particular implementation of the vector addition loop as taking 11 cycles per iteration. What I mean by an iteration of the loop is uh, for the do loop that constitutes the iteration, one pass through the do loop is what I refer to as an iteration. So, the particular vector addition loop that we are talking about has to execute 1024 iterations and each iteration takes 11 cycles as per the current implementation, 7 useful instructions and possibly 4 no ops. Now, in, un, in our understanding of the pipeline, we realize that we should be able to improve this loop by taking into account the fact that the 11 cycles includes 4 no ops. We could try to do something, maybe some kind of re reordering of the instructions to reduce the number of no ops that are required. So, that is what we will try to do next. We will try to reason about whether we can reorganize the instructions in this code fragment in some way to eliminate some of these no ops. So, the basically what we talked about as static instruction scheduling. We will go through that exercise just to see to what extent we can improve this code. So, what I have done over here is I have come up with a, a particular ordering of the instructions and we will just check whether this ordering of the instructions is correct to start off with. So, the f load is where it used to be, this f load is where it used to be. What I have done is I have taken the add immediate instruction and moved it up. The f add is the f add and the add immediate and the ble are in the order they used to be. However, I have taken the f store and I have moved it down. Okay, so, essentially I have moved two instructions. I have moved the add i instruction up by two instructions and I have moved the f store instruction down to the low, uh, branch delay slot. Now, the, the first thing I do need to check is whether this program is correct, whether I have changed the meaning of the program. So, let us think first about the, the, the first change that I made. In other words, moving the add i instruction from where it was into the third locations. So, the, the first thing that I have to check is I have moved the add i instruction above the f store instruction. And uh, when I move the add i instruction above the f store instruction, I note that the f store instruction is using r1 and the add i instruction is modifying r1 and that therefore, this is not a safe move unless I suitably adjust for the use of r1 inside the f store instruction. Now, if I move the add i instruction above the f store instruction, that would mean that the incrementing of r1 will happen by 8 before the f store instruction is executed. 
and that by moving the add i instruction above the store, I am artificially causing the store instruction to use the wrong address unless I use a different displacement for the store instruction correcting for the early addition by the add i instruction hence the minus 8. In other words by moving the add i instruction up and by changing the store instruction to have a displacement of minus 8 I have annulled the effect on the add i instruction from the perspective of the store instruction. Now I have also moved the add i instruction above the f add instruction but you will notice that they are independent of each other and that therefore that is a safe move. Therefore in, fr from these arguments we argue that we, re we realize that moving the add i instruction is a safe move. Now the next question I seem to have moved the f store instruction all the way down to the branch delay slot. In other words I have moved it past the add immediate instruction and past the branch instruction. Now the f store instruction uses f4 and reads from R1. I notice that the add i instruction does not affect either and the branch instruction does not affect either, does not modify either and that therefore moving the f store instruction to the, the branch delay slot is once again safe. It basically does not affect the correctness of the program. So my observation is that by making these two, by, by moving these two instructions from the original version of the program, program fragment, I have not affected the correctness of the program. The program is still correct. It does the, the loop on the right does the same thing as the loop on the left. Now what remains to be done is to try to count how many cycles the new loop will take per iteration. So once again we go through the analysis. We worry about the load delay slot of the f load and we notice that it is filled by an instruction that does not use f of 0. We worry about the load delay slot of the f load f2 and we notice that it is filled by an instruction that does not use f of 2. We worry about the two instructions following the floating point add instruction and we notice that neither of them uses f4. And finally we notice that there is a useful instruction in the branch delay slot. And uh, hence when we analyze the newly uh, or, or the reordered, the, the rescheduled, statically restructured program, we come to the conclusion that we do not require any no ops at all. In other words, the code on the right will run at 7 cycles per iteration. So there has been a substantial improvement in the uh, execution time of the resultant program. It has come from 11 cycles to 7 cycles. That is an improvement by 4 cycles, which is better than a 33 percent improvement in the runtime of the program. Okay, so that was just a simple example of static uh, instruction scheduling. We have seen this before in a, in a simpler example and we realize now that even with com more complicated pipeline semantics, one could do s something similar and improve the quality of pr uh, the instruction sequences. But there is still a question of whether we can do even better than this. And um, I am going to introduce one more idea which is often useful and which if one has sufficient understanding of pipelines one could try in cases where the, the loop is uh, of great importance to your program. So if you want an even faster loop, there is a concept which we could try which is known as loop unrolling. L let me talk a little bit about loop unrolling. Now the idea of loop unrolling is that we know that we have to execute a particular loop a certain number of times. So for, uh, for example in our particular uh, vector addition loop, we know that we have to iterate through the body of the loop 1024 times. Now the idea of loop unrolling is that each iteration or each time we go through the loop rather than doing one iteration of the vector addition, we could try to do two iterations of the vector addition. In other words, each time through the loop, the sequence of instructions, we try to do more than one iteration of the vector addition. Now the, the question is why would this be useful and there are actually several reasons that it might be useful. The first is if I actually do two iterations of vector addition each time through the loop, this would mean that the number of instructions within the loop will increase. If there are more instructions in the loop, then that gives me more opportunities to try to reorder instructions in order to avoid no ops. Therefore this is a useful property and just for this reason it might be useful for a programmer or a compiler to try to unroll a loop. If the loop it initially was very small, it may not contain enough iterations if it is not unrolled, it may not contain enough iterations for aggressive uh, static uh, instruction reordering to allow for improvement in performance of the loop. By unrolling the loop, by doing two or three or four iterations of vector addition in each pass through the loop, one is creating a lot more instructions for potential reordering. Okay, now another benefit of uh, the 
idea of loop unrolling is if I do 2 or 3 or 4 iterations of vector addition each time through the loop before branching back that would mean that the number of times that I have to increment the loop variables and the number of times that I have to branch is going to come down. In other words less instructions will be executed for loop control. By loop control I mean the incrementing of the loop variables, the checking to see whether the loop, it is time for the loop to terminate etc. The number of instructions executed for that loop control will reduce which is going to mean that the program can run a little bit faster. So this is also a positive. There is of course a possible negative and that is if I unroll the loop and do the work of let us say 3 iterations every time through the loop then the loop is going to become bigger. As a consequence the program is going to become bigger in size. The number of bytes occupied by the instructions of the program is going to become bigger and if I unroll the, the, if I unro uh, unroll the loop a large number of times this may end up being a problem because the size of the program may become substantial but uh, as long as we do not make the program too large the negative may not be that much of a concern. Okay, now let us look at an example for the code fragment that we have. We are going to try to unroll the loop. Now what I am using over here in the unrolling example is the original version of our loop. This is not the version of our loop that I had rescheduled in order to reduce its execution time from 11 cycles to 7 cycles. Rather I am using the original uns uh, un uh, unstatically scheduled version of the loop. Okay, now when I look at this uh, version of the loop I notice that if I look at the first 4 instructions they are the instructions of the loop which are using which are doing the useful work of one iteration of vector addition and if I look at the last 3 instructions they are the instructions which I would call the loop overhead or the loop uh, what did I refer to it in the previous slide loop control. So this is the loop control overhead. Okay, now my objective in doing loop unrolling is I each time through the loop I want to do more than one iteration of vector addition which means that I am going to have more than one copy of the first 4 instructions. So here I have one copy, I have copied it exactly as it is. This might be a sequence of code which is doing a of 0 plus b of 0 new value of a of 0. Now I also want to do one more iteration in the same loop and that is going to be a of 1 equals a of 1 plus b of 1. Now the question is how can I have a sequence of instructions which does similar operations but with a of 1 rather than a of 0, b of 1 rather than b of 0 and the answer is I can actually use the same sequence of code but rather than using a displacement of 0 with each memory access I will use a displacement of 8, 8 being the size of each element of, this ve of these vectors. That is how I come up with the second sequence of 4 instructions which are the brown instructions as you will see. So they too are copies of the code that was the useful instructions in my original loop. However whenever there was a 0 R1 or a 0 R2 I replace it by an 8 R1 or an 8 R2 thereby actually doing the computation on the next element of the array A or B. Okay, now at the end of this I need to have the loop overhead and obviously I need to increment r of 1. The question is how much do I need to increment r of 1 by? You will note that previously I was incrementing r of 1 by 8 because I was in the next iteration I was going to deal with the next element whereas in the unroll loop I am going to need to increment r of 1 by 16 since I need to move to not a of 1 but to a of 2 which is 16 bytes away. Similarly I need to increment r of 2 by 8 by 16 and finally I can have the loop terminating instruction. So I have a sequence of what is now 11 instructions. However remember that I had started with the sequence of code from the unscheduled uh, version of vector addition and therefore I need to do the accounting of no ops that have to be added to handle load delay slots, branch delay slots and the problem with the floating point add instructions floating point arithmetic instructions. That analysis will be very similar to what we did before. There will be the need for one no op after the f load f2 in both of the iterations and there will be the need for two no ops after the f add in both and finally one more no op for the branch delay slot. So if I add the total number of instructions you will notice that there are 11 useful instructions along with 7 no ops which is a total of 
18 cycles, but in this case it is 18 cycles per loop per pass through the loop which in which I am actually doing 2 iterations which means that I am actually if I use this piece of code as it is I am able to execute the vector addition loop at 9 cycles per iteration. Let me just remind you that for the originally scheduled code we were actually talking about uh, 7 plus 4 or 11 cycles per iteration which we had brought down to 7 cycles per iteration with reordering of the instructions. We now see that by just doing loop unrolling we are able to get 9 cycles per iteration. Okay, now in this unroll loop you will notice that there are several no ops and there are also several instructions and as you will imagine it is going to be quite easy to reorder the instructions to eliminate all of these no ops. In fact uh, I, I will leave that as an exercise but it is possible to eliminate all of those no ops and end up with 11 cycles for 2 iterations which is the equivalent of 5.5 .5 cycles per iteration, 5.5 cycles per iteration. So we have in effect by doing this loop unrolling improved the performance of this loop by 50 percent. It has come from 11 cycles per iteration to 5.5 .5 cycles per iteration. Now you will note that I could conceivably improve the performance of this loop even more if I did more unrolling. For example, I could have done 4 iterations of the loop each time, 4 iterations of vector addition each time through this loop. And in fact, I could have carried this through up to a point where I did 1024 cycles, uh, 1024 iterations of vector addition each time through the loop. However, that would have been an example of a case where the size of the program may end up being large and of a, a, a problem to the execution time of the resultant program. Therefore, we do not consider the extreme case of unrolling the loop completely. Remember, if I had, I had this loop which is supposed to iterate 1024 times, by unrolling it in this way, this loop now executes 512 times. If I had unrolled it 1024 times, then the resultant piece of code would have executed only once. It would have contained an unrolled version of all the 1024 vector element additions, but the program would have ended up being very large. So somewhere between this modest attempt at loop unrolling and the aggressive attempt of unrolling it all the way, there is going to be some point at which there is a very good version of the program which has uh, improved performance without much of the problems of the size of the program. Now one question which will have arisen in your mind is, in this particular example we have done the loop unrolling by taking the machine code and actually replicating or modifying parts of the machine code or the assembly code. And you will realize that you could have done pretty much the same thing by going back to the C code that you had started with. I will roll you back to the, the C code that we had started with over here. And now if we try to think about unrolling this loop, you will realize that I could have unrolled it in C by having each time through the loop not only the computations on A of i, but also on A of i plus 1. So each time through this loop I compute a of i equals a of i plus b of i semicolon as well as a of i plus 1 equals a of i plus 1 plus b of i plus 1. Then of course I will have to make sure that I do not go through this loop too many times and that each time through the loop I increment or each time through the loop I increment by 2. So I could change this to i plus equals 2 thereby reducing the number of times the loop is executed from 1024 to 512 rather than incrementing by 1 I increment by 2 each time through the loop. So this is one way that one could achieve loop unrolling by manipulation of the C program. In addition as it happens you will find out that compilers like GCC will actually make it possible for you to ask them to do the loop unrolling on your behalf. And if you look carefully at the manual entry for GCC you will find out that there is an option for requesting that loop unrolling be done. And one could experiment with trying to unroll loops with the help of GCC, trying to unroll loops on one's own, or trying to unroll the loop in terms of the C language, the, the C version of the loop, and seeing which one results in a better performance for the resultant program. And along the way, some knowledge of the pipeline will end up being useful. Now, with, with this example, we have a fairly good idea that no, some knowledge of the pipeline is going to be important from the perspective of understanding what happens when our programs execute and conceivably in improving the quality of those programs maybe in terms of execution time. And I am going to wrap up the discussion of pipelining at this point.
Now, we will now move on to another important part of uh, the pro pro processor. You will remember that when we started talking about the execution of instructions, we made the important assumption that the processor, that the memory system are organized such that there is something called cache memory and that uh, it was necessary for us to be able to ignore memory latencies. You will recall that the, the one of the big problems in our early discussion of computer organization was that we were talking about a processor which operated on a time scale of nanosecond and a main memory which operated on a time scale of maybe 100 nanoseconds, 100 times slower and that therefore it was very difficult to talk about the, the activity that happens in one processor cycle when whenever a mem memory operation happens there was a, a delay of 100 cycles and therefore we just made the simplifying assumption that there was something called a cache memory which removed that necessity and made it appear that memories could operate at processor speeds. And therefore this was uh, an important assumption that we made and ran through our discussion of pipelining and made it possible to talk about pipelines with throughputs and speed ups r related to the number of stages within the pipeline. Now uh, we need to understand more about this very clearly the cache memory itself is an integral and very important part of the computer system and therefore I will formally get into that discussion with uh, some introductory comments in, in today's lecture. So basically the cache memory is hardware that makes this assumption that we had made happen or makes the assumption that we had made possible. The piece of hardware that makes it reasonable to assume that most of the time memory latencies will be hidden and that the processor can be designed to assume that it operates at processor speed for all its different activities. Now, the primary design principle behind the organization of cache memories is something that we have fortunately already seen and that is the principle of locality of reference. You will remember that we saw the principle of locality of reference in connection with virtual memory when we were trying to reason how an operating system could model the behavior of programs and at that time it was important to for the operating system to have some model about how programs behaved in order to get some perspective on which pages are likely to be used by the program in the future. So the basic uh, concepts of locality of reference that we saw, again I will remind you about this, were two. One was temporal locality which suggested that least recently used objects are least likely to be referenced in the near future. So this was essentially what temporal locality was telling us and you will note that this was the, the basis for using page replacement policies such as LRU, least recently used. Although unfortunately we found that LRU, it was not feasible to implement LRU exactly as a page replacement policy. But in terms of a principle, uh, the, lo local, the temporal locality tells us something about uh, the least recently used objects being the ones that are least likely to be referenced in the near future and hence the ones that are best candidates for replacement. On the other hand there was the spatial locality which suggested that if a, particular, if a particular memory location is referenced now then both it and its neighbors are likely to be referenced in the near future. So both the principles of locality temporal and spatial are suggesting how programs behave in terms of their behavior in the future and this is the kind of thing which can be used in designing either a page replacement policy in the case of an operating system or in designing as we are now shortly going to find out the operation of a cache memory. Okay, now as, uh, as you would guess cache memories exploit the principle of locality of reference and uh, we have to understand that cache is when we use the word cache we are referring to a hardware structure and that what the hardware does is to provide the memory objects they could be instructions, they could be data, that is why I refer to them as objects that the processor references. Now it provides them directly most of the time, in other words it does not refer to main memory in order to get them, that would have taken 100 nanoseconds so that would not have made sense and further that the cache hardware is so fast that it is almost at processor speed which is why we could talk about the amount of time that it takes to access an instruction cache or the amount of time that it takes to access a data cache as being similar to the amount of time that it takes to do an ALU operation when we were talking about definition of cycle time. 
So, that was a more or less what we were assuming at that time. So, this then is some kind of a definition of what the cache will do for us. It is hardware that provides the data or instruction that the processor references directly. In other words, not uh, getting it out of main memory each time and at very uh, low time overhead. In other words, very fast. So, the picture that you should have in mind as far as cache memory is concerned is there is the CPU which we have learned a lot about, there is the main memory which we have learned enough about. One thing that we know about the main memory is that it is quite large. We know that the main memory could contain gigabytes. In processors today, 4 gigabytes of main memory is not uncommon for computers of today, but that it is unfortunately slow. So, we know that whenever the processor generates an address, it, this could be in order to fetch an instruction. On the other hand, it could be in order to load a piece of data from memory into a register. Subsequently, it gets the data back, but we are now being told that rather than the address going all the way to memory and the data coming from memory, the activity may actually be happening out of this thing called the cache memory. And uh, I show the cache memory as this very small uh, box. Uh, two comments I would like to make about the notation which I have used. You will notice that I have shown the cache memory in green rather than in yellow. In this slide, I am using green as the color associated with the processor and I am using yellow as the color associated with the main memory. Therefore, by showing you the cache block as being in green, I am clearly saying that view the cache as being part of the processor, not as part of the memory. So, if one looked at the packaging, one might find the cache being incorporated with the processor, possibly on a, on a chip as opposed to the memory which would be on several chips, other chips. The second thing I would like to point out is that in comparison to the size of the CPU or in the size of the main memory, I am purposely showing the cache as being extremely small. In fact, I am showing it so small that you cannot even read the word cache in the, the label which I have attached there. But that is just meant to make the point that in practice the cache is so small that it is almost uh, insignificant in size compared to the size of the main memory. When we talked about the main memory as potentially being gigabytes in size, let me just point out for the moment that the size of the cache is actually going to be maybe a few tens of kilobytes in size. So, just note that we are talking about something which is several thousand times smaller than the main memory. Giga is uh, in, in this perspective is to be viewed as being billions and kilo is only thousands. So, there is a substantial difference in the size and technically I should have drawn the green blob even smaller. But I've, what I have shown it over here is much too large if you look at this size comparison. Now, the, the, this uh, small size is going to be part of the reason for its speed. By being small, it is going to be possible for cache to be accessed at high speed. Let me uh, give you some idea about the general principles of operation about the cache through a pictorial means. So, now I am expanding that uh, tiny cache blob. So, what we are going to see on the next slide is an expansion of this tiny cache blob because we have to understand what is happening inside the cache. So, as far as the cache is concerned, remember it is a piece of hardware and the operation of the cache starts with an address coming to the cache from the processor. So, this is a line, uh, uh, some information coming to the cache, a request to access the instruction or the data at the address A. Now, obviously within the cache, there has to be some amount of very fast memory. And as I have suggested, the amount of fast memory may not be too much. It might just be about 32 kilobytes, but there has to be some fast memory pa as part of the cache. And this is where some of the data which is actually resident in main memory is going to be remembered. Now, when the address A comes to the cache from the processor, there also has to be some part of the cache which is going to be capable of determining whether the address A, the contents of memory address A are currently present in this fast memory. Note that since the cache fast memory is so much smaller than the actual main memory, at any given point in time, only a very small fraction of the contents of main memory can be present in the cache memory. And therefore, obviously, the cache has to keep track, the cache hardware has to keep track of what the current contents of its fast memory are. And when the processor sends an address A to the cache with a request to give it that particular instruction or that particular piece of data, the cache must have some logic, some hardware which can determine whether or not that particular entity, instruction or piece of data 
is currently present in the fast memory. Therefore, some logic, some hardware, some circuitry which can answer the question do I currently have this particular object, instruction or piece of data. Now, in order to answer the question do I currently have it, in other words is the instruction at address A currently inside this fast memory, the cache hardware is going to have to have a table which keeps track of the various things which are currently inside the fast memory. Right? So, a table of the addresses that the cache currently has. So, in order to do the lookup, in order to do, to answer the question do I have the object at address A, it has to keep track of the different things that it has in its fast memory and that would come in the form of a table of addresses that are currently inside the fast memory. Now, I have presented the design of the cache in a somewhat non-technical sense. I have talked about a piece of hardware which is labeled do I have it and a, a table of addresses I have. This is obviously not the, the technical terms that are used for these entities. Let me just tell you what the technical terms used for these three entities are. The three entities being the fast memory within the cache which is used to store a very small fraction of what is inside the main memory. The, the, the piece of hardware circuitry which determines whether or not the address A is present inside the fast memory and the table of addresses which are, which is used by that piece of logic in order to de make that determination. Now, these three things are actually known as the cache RAM, the lookup logic or the cache lookup logic and the cache directory. So, in general when we talk about the, the operations of the cache, we will talk about a part of the cache which is called the cache controller. Just as we talked about the control hardware of the CPU, there is going to be some hardware within the cache which actually manages the operation of the cache and the cache controller is going to manage the activity. So, when an address A comes to the cache from the main mem fr from the processor, the cache controller initiates the lookup logic with the address A. The lookup logic looks up in the cache directory to see if the address A is currently there. If the address A is found within the cache directory, the cache directory will contain a link to which particular location in the cache RAM contains that data and the data will be returned to the processor. On the other hand, if the lookup logic determines that address A is not currently represented in the cache directory, then the situation will have to be handled and we may be talking about a problem similar to the problem that we saw when we were talking about page faulting and we may find out that some similar criteria may come into play in how the cache controller handles the various scenarios that could arise. We will look into these details about the operation of the cache in the few lectures to come. But for the moment, let me close by just summarizing, letting you know that we have moved to the next major topic of our course on high performance computing, in which we are looking at the parts of the computer system which relate to memory. We are not going to spend too much time looking at main memory itself, we are going to spend a reasonable amount of time looking at cache memory, the different possible organizations of cache memory and more specifically how a programmer must take into account cache design in modifying the way that programs are written. We will also make some comments about the role that cache plays in what is called the hierarchy of different forms of memory inside a computer system and uh, I will close at this point today. Thank you.